Hello. Hello. <laughs> Uh, my name is Christina Tradulo. I'm uh, an architect and co-founder at Space Exploration Architecture here with another one of my co-founders, Michael Morris. And we're um, going to talk to you uh, from this module in Emerging Fields in Architecture at the TU uh, Wien. And um, I'm, so I'm a practicing architect uh, based in New York, but um, I've studied astronomy and philosophy in the past. I'm also currently pursuing PhD in ecosystems and architecture. Maybe I'll let Michael, you introduce yourself as well. Hi, I'm Michael Morris. I'm an architect. Uh, as Christina mentioned, I'm a co-founder of Space Exploration Architecture. And I'm also a principal of my own firm, Morisata Studio uh, Architecture here in New York. And uh, uh, I'm also a professor. I teach at Pratt Institute, um, particularly of interest my, to this course might be I've been teaching the NASA XHAB uh, studio where the students have been um, looking at designing uh, uh, various forms of spaceships and habitats on Mars and this, this term on the moon in parallel with uh, NASA's mis mission objectives. That's it. Wonderful. So I'm gonna start showing my screen. Oh, I need to. And now you can. Now you can, Christina. Okay, thank you. So I want to thank first thank Sandra so much for having us both here today. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit, and then Michael and I are going to spar after <laughs> afterwards. Um, so. As we, talk, as we mentioned, we're architects. Um, I worked on a number of the projects you see here. Um, and I've been trying to walk a particular tightrope between research and practice and earth and space. Um, these areas might feel antithetical. You might ask a practicing architect and they might, they might ask, what is architectural research and why is it necessary in a service industry? If you were asking an aerospace engineer, they might imagine architects come in like artists, adding window dressings or providing renderings. Architects have built without much in the way of design research in the past, and engineers have sent human beings into space without much substantial input from designers and architects so far. So we might, though, now be in a moment where it's possible for all of these disparate areas to create a kind of positive feedback loop where research, whether that's scientific um, or philosophical thought or technological development meets and influences the practical realities of building and where the human dream of space flight might meet the practical needs of the developing world. So um, we're, today we're gonna talk about space architecture as a lens through which we can see how such an emerging practice or an emerging fields find relevance. Why space architecture? Why now? Heavy with the weight of global problems when there's so much to be done here on earth, problems of overpopulation, resource drain, climate change. Why do we look to space? Um, but I will argue for some of the reasons that architects should be looking up because it so clearly helps us to put ourselves in the right frame of mind as we look around. So rather than speak specifically to any one project in detail, uh, we'll see some work from, work from search, from some, from some of the uh, work in my PhD, from students past and present and other architects past and present. What I wanna try to do with you today is a kind of an experiment to have a look at space and earth projects side by side to try to see some thematic connections clearly. In this way, I hope to frame the conversation about why we should be interested in space as architects and why it's particularly relevant to the field now and conversely, why those in the space industry should be concerned with architecture. So there'll almost always be on the left a picture of an earth architecture project and then on the right of a space architecture one. And what I'd like to try to convince you of is that design for space gives us a unique perspective, a new vantage point from which to question our preconceptions in design. In the absolute void, removed from context, removed from the extents of global resources, from historical reference or even the very standards of design that have evolved over millennia, we come face to face with what might be essential in the creation of a place or an environment for human beings. At its pedagogical level, space architecture challenges us to realize the biases that we've come in with, the culture, the, the 
climate, our technological norms, and to question how and why we design the way we do. And at its practical level, any experience in creating and demonstrating a place that operates within limited means and resources, limited energy, air, water, and material, limited space, um, is at, at demonstrating that at scale, will have immense promise to return knowledge and provide feedback for earth construction that must also begin to act as though materials and resources were limited as they are. So we're gonna touch on a, some themes, which are some of them are sort of hot topics of today. We're gonna to talk about um, critical regionalism or designing for place, talking about living in high density or in small spaces, uh, autonomous construction, sustainability in closed loop systems with a particular focus on including plants and biodiversity in the built environment, and then the role of um, interdisciplinarity. So I think the first thing to understand is the design for space is particularly, is kind of an extension of design in any location. Architecture anywhere is a kind of uh, protection from the elements. Of course, a rainstorm is a bit less harsh than several hundred degree temperature swings. But the second thing to understand is that design for space is like nowhere we've ever designed before. And so it makes us question what it means to design for a place. I like this quote from Arctic Dreams um, that uh, in which the Eskimos called us the people who change nature. And that's in many ways what we must, what we have to do to live in most climates and especially in space. We change the nature inside our buildings. And space architecture brings us face to face with this question of to what extent we are able to integrate with the environment or to what extent we need to create an artificial one sort of in the direct lineage of a, a modernist architecture. So you can already ask of many of our buildings whether or not we're designing for earth now. Are we quote unquote living with the land? The question is to what extent today design is in the context of the natural environment or is a substitute for it? So in many ways, the purpose of the building, as I said, is to create these human comfort levels uh, in, in out, uh, that where the outside environment might be too harsh. So inside we're able to be cool and conditioned um, and warm and dry. And in, in millennia past, we had vernacular architecture, which showed us passive means of adapting to harsh climates. Um, on the left, we have a, uh, a Native American settlement using an overhang to sheet to shade um, and keep buildings cool and the use of materials that would keep buildings cool in a desert climate, no air conditioning needed. On the right here in Mars uh, X house version one, which is a project of space exploration architecture, we looked at those deep overhangs and we'd be using and using horizontal lighting to shield from solar radiation. But somewhere in the past century, we became quote unquote modern. Uh, in 1933, Le Corbusier extolled the virtues of centralized air conditioning systems saying, quote, at this moment of general diffusion of international scientific techniques, I propose only one house for all countries, the house of exact breathing, the Russian house, the Parisian, at Suez or in Buenos Aires, the luxury liner crossing the equator will be hermetically sealed. In winter, it is warm inside, in summer cool, which means that at all times there is clean air inside at exactly 18 degrees. The house is sealed fast. And he may very well have been speaking of a space habitat, the Martian house, the International Space Station, the Earth one. In our day and age, at all times, there's clean air inside is exactly 18 degrees. Uh, this is a Christina, particular- Christina, Christina, <laughs> I'm sorry. Are your slides supposed to be advancing or? No, this one I'm, I'm staying on. Okay, okay. <laughs> For, yes. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so, so this idea that we're inside clean air, 18 degrees, no matter where we are, Earth space, um, Mars, Moon, Paris, uh, this is a particular modernist fantasy that's uh, everywhere architecture need not be limited by its place or its environment. So what difference is it then if we seal ourselves inside a high rise air conditioned building, a machine for living in this bubble on Earth? On the left, this is a, an image from Rainer Bonham's Environment Bubble. Or if we're on the surface of another one, on the right, this is another search project, the Mars Ice Home, where we seal ourselves in sort of an ice and air bubble on Mars. So Rainer Bonham's famous article, A House is Not a Home, depicted the state of modern American architecture anyways, as such a complex of piping, flues, ducts, wires, lights, inlets, outlets, ovens, sinks, antenna, conduit, freezers, heaters, that the house is perceived simply as a hollow shell. And uh, he uh, 
talks about um, the weather conditioned house that is a uh, and the shell being an extraordinary inefficient barrier to heat and cold. So basically, on the right, we understand it with uh, our environmental life control support systems for space. Um, we're seeing an entire we're seeing an entire uh, habitat that's really a shell with with ducts and piping and wiring and all the things that we need to, to stay alive. And on the left is this is a drawing of a particularly American house. I know that that's not necessarily in Europe. You're a little bit better with not needing air conditioning, but the, the, this idea that we're supported by all this by this machine to create our interior environment uh, is sort of very much. Um, part of both earth and space architecture. So, but we know where that's gotten us. We're in a situation in which buildings consume 40% of the total energy we produce in order to fuel these massive mechanical solutions. On the one hand, we may see space as being uh, impossible to work without the machine, but the, the harshness of space simply makes us confront the issue. We're, we are not working as if we were, work, we're back in the, you know, the Native American uh, vernacular. We are working in, uh, in this idea that we're inside the machine. Um, but in actuality, being more passive in our environmental systems, using less energy, using local materials is important no matter where you are. It's passive design or vernacular design or a kind of critical regionalism essentially responds to using local resources, the local environment, creating places that reduce the loads on these machines through systems that are much more like physics than engineering. Um, we will need to create energy locally. Um, we can't transport with a, transport steel beams from around mines around the world. We don't have infinite supplies of water and processed materials to use as if they were still connected to our global infrastructure. Um, to construct structures as well, we'll have to use what's there, whether that's regolith or water, or even extract material from the very atmosphere itself. Um, we have to be extremely local. And at the moment, we're thinking about how to use those materials essentially in a very raw way without using much power to, to, on, um, to extract raw materials on the surface of a planet. On, on, on the right, here's some examples of some IRSRU uh, material processing has to be done with low energy to do otherwise is too taxing. So we're, we don't have the, the whole infrastructure that we have on the left. And if we start to think as earth architects in the same way that we shouldn't de depend and rely on um, these global supplies and this energy intensive material production, maybe we can start to think about how to do things a little bit more locally Chris, a Chris, bit less Christina, energy. Christina, sorry, I'm still stuck on slide number one. Oh no, really? Yes, I oh, I, I don't geez. know if everybody else is that condition. Oh, I'm no, still on slide wrong. number one. <laughs> oh, no, that is everybody else on that too. Oh no. Yeah, we just see the research. Oh no, let's try it again. You should have been seeing quite <laughs> a bunch of things. <laughs> Wow, now we see them, I think. <laughs> yeah, oh, now we're now, now we we're see dancing. the sliding. Yeah, great. <laughs> okay. Thank you. That's what I was <laughs> trying to say before, and I thought, okay, I better I be thought, quiet. I thought you just read that one <laughs> slide. Oh no, guys. So um so we've been seeing, or at least I have, <laughs> uh earth and space images next to each other. And maybe we'll just take a, a quick step back um to say you know, to see some of these images, because I think it's important to sort of demonstrate this point about, uh, about, you know, whether or not we should be working in sort of this mechanical way of using extreme amounts of energy to produce interior environments that have nothing to do with the exterior environment, um, or whether we should be looking at more traditional ways of building um, and sort of passive and vernacular designs uh, and as well, so <laughs> these are some of the, the, uh, the mechanical works on earth and space. Um, and well, uh, this is where we the, were. I was particularly remiss when you were talking about the Rainer Banham. I'm like, yeah. we're not Rainer Banham. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah, this is, so this is the, uh, the uh, an image from Rainer Banham describing, you know, that the, that the house is really sort of a, a machine inside of a bubble and, and in space, 
we might be doing exactly the same thing. I mean, this, this sort of illustrates the point where earth and space architecture have quite a lot to do with each other. Um, and uh, this is where we were to say that, you know, on, in earth, on earth, we're used to sort of these huge networks of material and energy. We use them as if they were abundant and we could get anything from anywhere and make anything. Um, and, in, and in space, we're gonna have to operate as if things were limited. And it would behoove us probably on earth to start acting the same way as if uh, we needed to work with local materials, we needed to process them without very much energy and just and figure out how we're going to build given a sort of limited uh, range rather than um, having what we perceive to be as a complete abundance on earth. So uh, that's one reason why in the Mars Ice House project we chose to use water as a building material. This is Mars Ice House was uh, the 2015 first place winner of the NASA Centennial Challenge um, and so we decided that we were going to use water, which is a local resource on Mars and necessary to maintain human life. It's been a source of life and civilization on Earth for millennia. We live near water here. We'll live near water in space. So in space, it's not only used for sustaining life. It also is used for the production of hydrogen, which is uh, when combined with the carbon from the atmosphere makes methane for fuel uh, or even polyethylene materials. Um, Furthermore, if architecture is, as Rainer Bannum put it, the hollow shell, uh, it's the wall section that between the interior environment and the harsh exterior that we need um, to address. And we need to think about a passive solution for that wall section, which through material and form relieves our dependence on those mechanical apparatus. So in its raw form, water acts as a very effective radiation shield, um, absorbing harmful higher energy frequencies while transmitting light in the visible spectrum. So not only is gonna provide us um, that radiation protection, which we need on the surface of Mars, but it's also going to be translucent, uh, or in some cases, if we can get it a bit transparent that um, we are able to, to see. Um, so we use water as a printed material, um, encasing it in an inflatable pressurized membrane. Um, here's some more images of it. And we further developed the project with NASA Langley Research Center using water ice as infill to, inflatable, to an inflatable facade cell system, which we combined with the CO2 gas of the Martian atmosphere as an insulation layer. So again, we're using the materials that we have on hand. So all the while we're focusing on that idea of the wall section that we're using materials in a certain way to allow daylight uh, in to reduce the demand on lighting systems uh, among other things. Um, so we use other materials, the insulating layers to reduce heating loads. And of course, it's uniquely a kind of ethereal uh, effect to be inside a place where you're connected to uh, the, the day and night cycles of the Martian environment. And water is thought to be abundant in the universe and is certainly anywhere we want to go to explore. We need to have water to live by. It's also a good biosignature for life. But water is also a limited resource and we have to remember that. So water is not uh, as abundant uh, here and it's certainly not abundant everywhere on earth either. Um, in fact, uh, we need to be thinking about using water sustainably here on earth, just as we do in space. Um, there's a NASA spin-off technology that uses the water recovery system, which has been on the International Space Station um, that they use in developing countries to harvest and recycle local water. So once again, is, to, is when you remove design from the expanded global context, you're all but forced to be absolutely maniacal in your use of resources and materials and in your independence from the grid. Um, and you need to be using passive energy to control environmental systems. So to design for space is to truly understand how to design for your local environment and how to create a circular economy. Um, that said, our systems for living in space today still rely on heavily on mechanical systems, um, but we will just need to find a way to make space sustainable. Um, and in doing so, we'll be looking at how to make Earth sustainable as well. So the next topic um, is living in high density or living in small spaces. Uh, we spend 90% of our time indoors and that was before a global pandemic. 
um, in space, our human beings will send absolutely 100% of their time indoors and quarantined from the planetary hazards outside. Our current space habitats are constrained by volume and weight. There's so much area we can build. And for now, we've lived in space in small spaces. Physical area is also a resource which we'll have less of in space. So uh, Michael can speak quite a bit to the idea of minimum habitable volume. He did a study on this uh, at NASA Johnson Space Center. And the definition of minimum habitable volume is closely related to the amount of time you spend in space. So on the right here's for an hour space flight, uh, you might be comfortable to be constrained to a chair, but for 500 days on the surface of Mars, you might need more space. Uh, Michael, I forgot how, what you came to the conclusion as to how much space per person you would need for that, for that mission. Doing a transit habitat and we were saying 25 cubic meters per person. Um, in the overall habitat with the sort of notion that a, a private birth required two people um, for the event of quarantine and or medical uh, person coming into the private space of an individual. Um, so that was a sort of the big, big change on that, but um, yeah. So we fought for the engineering wanted 18 cubic meters, uh, 18 or 19 at the, at the max, and we fought for 25. So we, we, we managed to submit our report. <laughs> so of course uh, you might um, find that to be somewhat familiar to a notion if you look at earth occupancy guidelines on the left is the international building code occupancy table. So for a hotel room, you might need only a few square meters, but for a home for living, you might want a little bit more maybe culturally dependent. So. If we take a look at the size of spade capsules to date, on average, uh, the volume or area per person, you can start to compare them with analog spaces on Earth. Whether those are standards are based on international building codes or simply cultural standards. <coughs> for example, for uh, Mercury, which took 15 minutes, uh, they had 1.7 cubic meters, which is kind of uh, similar to something uh, to the international building code for a classroom for a desk. Um, for the Apollo mission, 17 days, they had 19.6 cubic meters. And that's about the size of a standard dorm room. Um, at Skylab with 84 days, that was more or less the size of a single family detached house. Mere um, 473 days maximum. That's, uh, they gave about a, uh, the amount of space um, as an open office uh, in, at the ISS. They're used to Houston, Texas. Let's give them the same amount of space as a small house. Though to be fair, this is packed with experiments and equipment. Um, and for Mars, we know it'll take 2.4 years. And as Michael said, 25 cubic meters per person, which we could imagine might look like an average person in a small, Hong Kong apartment. So what, what exactly are these minimum volumes based on? Um, in space, there are two contributing factors. At the most basic is the scale of the human body, these standard male and female body types and their range of motion, albeit in specific gravities, govern minimum vehicle standards. Um, the other factor is the vehicle we have that will transport uh, these habitats. Um, though with ideas of expandable and inflatable habitats and autonomous assembly on site, those transportation constraints mean less and less. And vehicle sizes too are in the relative scale of a human body. We do send satellites into space the size of small toasters, CubeSats, um, but for the most part, the entire world of space exists at the human rather than nano or micro scale, which is a very intimate scale compared to the vast realm of space. So coming to terms how, with how we view minimum habitable standards on earth is a serious question for architects today. To what extent are we influenced by cultural norms of habitation sizes? Where do those cultural norms come from? If not from the critical size of the human body, why in Australia do they want so much more room per person than in Hong Kong? And excuse me for one moment, please. Working from home means you need uh, to deal with children. So hold on one. Michael? Mm. 
Michael has his hands up. Michael, can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Someone else? Uh, okay, thank you, Fabian. <laughs> Michael cannot hear me. Um, Michael? Okay, it doesn't work. Let's uh, let's wait a little bit for Christina. So sorry, I'm back. Uh, don't worry, Christina, take your time. <laughs> oh. Oh, babies, uh, babies don't come to space just yet. <laughs> so. We need more space for babies, hmm? everywhere. Yes. <laughs> Oh, take okay, your time. I'm, it's fine. I'm sorry. No, no, take your time. It's fine. We have time. All right. <laughs> so, um, Michael's last sound connection. Okay. Okay. Yes, that is good, Michael. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, Christina? Yes, I'm back. I'm back. Okay, take a deep breath. <laughs> Everything's fine. <laughs> yeah, this is the all sorts thing. of things working from home these days. <laughs> I think it's good. We need more space for babies, more space for family in our work life. That's yes, absolutely. Ah, so, so we were talking about to what extent we're influenced by cultural norms of habitation sizes. What are we used to in terms of minimum volumes? What's a standard? Where did we get these standards from? When you're when you're in space, you're confronted with a, without having that context, you start to realize well, where where did this stuff come from? Let's take a look at it. Um, so, why do some cultures live comfortably in tight spaces and others perceive lower densities as necessities? Vienna, you're privileged with quite a bit more open green area per person than many countries. Um, so as the global population increases and more and more people will crowd into large urban areas, what's the right density? Is a tiny house enough? How do we know? Is it based clinically on the human body and our rotational movements? Or is there a remainder of culture or an availability of resources? Um, I once asked an astronaut if there was a minimum size or volume she thought was right for a human and her answer was very much a military one. She could, she could take anything, it doesn't matter. Just give her the two square meters, that's or two cubic meters, that's enough for her body. But one wonders for those who must live with minimum resources for a range of reasons. So let's say a place like a refugee camp, is there a minimum standard for a person, a family or a community that we'll accept as a human community? Um, that's not a sort of astronaut, I can live in anywhere, anytime uh, feeling? Is there some minimum standard that we, we would agree to for all humans or is it absolutely culturally entrenched? It might be no wonder that IKEA is interested in both refugee camps and in space because both uh, are designed for small living. So here's an IKEA refugee project and then IKEA is also sponsoring um, Mars work and sort of li living within the small means, just like is in your uh, small European apartment. So once again, when you remove yourself from Earth and put yourself in, in sort of the void, we're forced to confront those questions of where these standards and size and scale have come from. Um, perhaps one of the biggest topics in space and earth architecture today is autonomous construction. And with the 3D, the NASA 3D printed habitat challenge that began in 2015 in partnership with the construction giants of Caterpillar, Bechtel, brick and mortar ventures. Oh, what slide should we see? Autonomous construction? Can you see I'm it? Sorry. No, we're still on the no. uh, space. I don't, I didn't see the screen at all. <laughs> okay. 
Can you see me now? I, I, at first I lost That's the good. sound and I rebooted. I came back, I went oh, off and no. came back on. And then I lost the screen. <laughs> well, let's, it's a good opportunity to go back and say, I left, I, le I left at the Hong Kong um, uh, apartment slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the, w w what we might uh, just say again about this is that we've, we have many different kind of standards of living and standards of what we think are small or right or, and, and these have a lot of cultural as well as physical um, uh, origins. And that is to say that space just help, helps us to question where, what are the origins of those standards? Like, how do we decide what's small enough or big enough? Um, you know, is it only a human, is it only the clinical evaluation of a human body and its metrics? Or is it something else that's cultural? And you, the only time that you actually are questioning those things is now in this in this space where there is no standard, which is outer space, which is you, you're sort of starting from scratch. It gives you that opportunity to re reevaluate uh, what what you've been doing. So, autonomous construction. <laughs> um, so it's no wonder why autonomous construction or autonomous anything is critical in space. The human presence is risky. We all need to establish remote operations before people arrive. Um, 3D printing offers us the possibility to go beyond modules and pre-deployed habitats to imagine a sort of a different or bigger landscape. Um, we can construct almost anything, tools, roads, landing pads, buildings, um, without a human being being there. Uh, the remote autonomous construction necessary for the moon and Mars have similar objectives to earth construction, that's rapid construction, um, which is uh, much more profitable uh, and has the potential to have an effect on a housing shortage. The semi-autonomous construction means less on-site personnel, which means a safer job site. Um, and 3D printing allows for the construction of more optimized and less repetitive structures, creating diver greater diversity and the ability to create places without extra cost. And if you can see the slide now, on the left is a build 3D printing, 3D printed building by Apis Core, and on the right is a um, one of our designs, the Mars X House version two, which was in the NASA Centennial Challenge uh, as well. So these are two 3D printing on two worlds. So designing any habitat, any habitat to be 3D printed isn't quite there yet. Um, although many, there are many plans to use in situ materials as building materials, um, using it for radiation protection alone in space requires some estimate three to five meters of regolith above a structure. On our 3D printing a roof, flat or otherwise is still a challenge. Um, Michael, you can probably speak to this a bit more. Um, and one wonders whether it might make sense to find shelter near a cliff that will block some radiation. Um, so in times past on either the surface of the moon or Mars, the atmosphere um, being nearly a vacuum makes it very difficult for a 3D printed habitat that it's own, that is only printed in a compressive material like regolith um, to hold an air like a water like an air balloon or an aerosol can. In in uh, in other times, we are always needed as air bladder to create the actual inhabited space, and we're only just beginning to explore uh, 3D printing tensile members or tensile structures, which are more akin to those air bladders. Um, so what are some of the earth arguments beyond the usual for autonomous construction? It raises some of those same questions. Will a robot replace my job? Is it better that way? Is this a new industrial revolution that will change our relationship to work for the better or worse? For, <clears throat> for architects, does this mean we'll need to be programmers and robot designers rather than work with standard materials like we're used to? I think the answer is yes, that professions do have to adapt and architects to have to find a new role where buildings are not only driven by ro robotic or autonomous construction, but also by data and optimization, whether that's either environmental or human factors. <coughs> so I'll talk a little bit about that Mars X House version two project. Um, 
and Mike, you can jump in whenever you feel uh, just to say um, that then we used here, a, we took a NASA mandate to use regolith, not water as a radiation shield and as the air bladder as well, which was something that was a, quite of a challenge um, because of the factors that I mentioned that it's, it's a compressive structure. There's a compressive material, regolith is not a, a great uh, air barrier. But we also tried to work with the ideas that material and form could be manipulated to give us this passive performance to let in light and air, uh, to let in light and um, sort of connection to the landscape as well, which we had always wanted. So the habitat synthesizes that, uh, that sort of environmental drivers, as well as those programmatic drivers. They're environmental drivers of needing radiation protection, the ability to let in light and views, to respond to the pressure environment on the one hand, and then the programmatic drivers of uh, the sort of safe um, safety and redundancy, separation of functions, layering of programs, and things that all architects are sort of familiar with, has come to come together in a in a sort of uh, a whole. So essentially, the pressure um, on Mars is nearly a vacuum which means the pressure vessels favor tension structures like balloons or inflatables. Um, so when working with a material that's better in compression like concrete or regolith, the outward thrust of pressure is best resisted with an arch, an inward facing arch, kind of like a, a dam. And this is again, we can start to see wh where things on earth um, have given us sort of some influence on designing for space. Even with the efficiency of that sort of hyperboloid inward arch design, the structure had uh, tensile stresses that were beyond the modulus of rupture. So this hyperboloid shape, though, allows us for sort of continuous um, reinforcement. And we were considering uh, basalt fiber reinforcement also from in-situ materials. Um, we're not, we weren't entirely sure whether that uh, is an airtight uh, bladder or airtight wall. So when thinking about the construction of the wall section, we sort of th saw, thought about it as the, the structural uh, wheel and the inner, in the inner tube was like in, a, like in a bicycle tire, which is similar to the way that the uh, trans have, if anyone's familiar with that is, is uh, created there. So there's an inner air bladder, which we uh, imagined to use uh, in situ made HDPE, which is kind of uh, kind of plastic um, liner to, to hold in the air, and then the regolith and the and the basalt fiber is the 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 tire, the thing that kind of holds it together, the structural thing that keeps it from keeps that inner tube air bladder from exploding. Um, so you can see a sort of the makeup of that wall section here. Um, because the atmosphere is thicker as we approach the horizon, there's less requirements for shielding at lower angles, which means we're able to bring in light up to 30 degrees. And we took great advantage of this uh, for Mars. We really wanted a sort of a human driver to connect people to the landscape and, and let, let in light just as we has done on the Ice House project. So we used sort of the overhangs of this thick wall section to create, um, to create a safe way to let in light and, and, and views um, which many habitats uh, have not done to date. Um, and of course, we, we also designed the programming not only in terms of the functional uh, work of the people um, who are living there, but also in terms of radiation protection. We've doubled the wall when, uh, when people are sleeping. This is where they would spend most of their time. So uh, double the amount of radi radiation protection where you spend the most time. And we did some calculations on where people are spending the most time based on their, um, based on their crew schedule and designed this vertical, vertical habitat. Um, just some images of uh, laboratories. Um, and once again, this is uh, all the while and keeping in, in um, mind that we're 3D printing and producing materials on site, deploying them autonomously on site. We have to be very cons uh, careful about which things are brought from Earth and deployed, and which things are printed there. And it's not very much unlike uh, sort of an Earth construction site where you have to think about, you know, how things are going to arrive on site, when they're going to arrive on site, and um, 
in but in essence, we're talking about using a local material economy, mining materials locally, using materials locally, le using less energy to do this whole thing and, and make a structure without even a, a human built human being built being there. Um, so we hope that this might influence uh, sort of that sort of local local building um, and uh, local resource use on earth construction as well. And perhaps the issue that space architecture raises most nearly to my heart is that of sustainability. I love this quote from Buckminster Fuller that uh, it is not the technology, it, uh, much of the most exciting and important point about tomorrow is not the technology or the automation at all, but that man is going to come into an entirely new relationship with his fellow men. And from my perspective, hopefully in a new relationship with the earth as well. An evolutionary biologist asked me once what I predicted to be the future of spaceship. What, what's, gonna, what's the future spaceship gonna look like? And I said, I didn't know exactly, but I think we're gonna come to understand that we can't go as human beings alone into space. That we'll learn that we have to take a piece of our planet with us and that we'll come to understand how intimately we are tied to the environment of earth and this planet. So, much like our earlier discussion on, on critical regionalism, designing with local materials and being passive in space, resource conservation and sustainable recycled environments is critical. We don't have the luxury to turn on the tap, to plug in the computer or to step outside and breathe fresh air. Uh, designing for space forces you to imagine the entire environment and not to rely on services or resources coming to you from, from somewhere else. We have to be completely off the grid, completely isolated. Um, and the most important thing for designers in space is to understand the complete cycle of their resource management. The circular or closed economy is as important on, our, on Earth as it is in space. And here's a version of the ecological house on the left, um, which you can see human beings waste is recycled and put back into the design. And on the right is a, is a closed loop system for resource uh, management the Melissa project, which is a, a European uh, space agency project to create an ecological life support system. So the first thing you realize is that we can't live off the planet um, without major mechanical resources. And then the solution that architects on earth think of are biological ones. We don't live alone on earth in terms of just human beings. And we can't afford to live alone as just human beings in space reliably for long periods of time. So I'm gonna thank Austria again for providing a beautiful example on the left, the Breathe Austria Pavilion, the 2015 Milan Expo created an attempt to create an Austrian forest capable of exchanging oxygen and CO2 for 800 people. So it claimed, the scientists are quite skeptical whether that uh, that's possible. I'm sorry, 18, sorry 1800 visitors. <laughs> um, and on the right, you have a, a plant growth system at a particularly different scale on the ISS at the moment. But this, the planet regulates its own rhythms and cycles at particular global scales. We have massive chemical and biological mechanisms that are so far removed from our human scale that we, but yet we still try to emulate those cycles in closed loops at the scale of architecture. Um, so. You know, if Bucky Fuller says we're all astronauts on spaceship Earth, OMA on the right here might say every building is a spaceship. Every building is its own standalone planet, closed loop system. Maybe something we should think about something somewhere in between. So architects of the day imagine rich buildings covered in green facades, the term greenwashing abounds. No doubt if we have any architects here, they put plants all over your buildings, inside your buildings, we love plants. Um, architects seem to have caught on to at least the image of bringing nature back to cities through vegetating our buildings. Um, and in space, we've been talking about bringing plants with us for years, uh, but it sort of seems to be coming back into culture ever since Matt Damon went uh, and planted some potatoes in the Martian uh, in 2015. But there's so much excitement about putting plants in buildings and plants in space. Uh, and it's such a visceral sort of connection to nature that we're longing for in our sort of monocultural mono environments. 
But the question is whether that's more than decorative or cultural, whether these plants can do anything for us. But architects claim a lot, like in this uh, Breathe Austria Pavilion that we're going to, you know, we're going to clean the air. But can they do that for us at the scales that we're talking about? Can they, can they sort of be used or should they be used? Um, how well can we replicate those cycles that are planted in architectural scale systems? And this is, a, this is the Melissa um, project that I mentioned before of the European Space Agency. They replicated a lake ecosystem in a series of pipes and tubes. I mean, this is a quite a juxtaposition of how is the nature on the left embodied in the nature on the right? How can we really replicate those functions in a way that actually performs? And can we do this at the scale that we're talking about? Can we can a green wall offset mechanical ventilation and give us fresh air without having huge mechanical systems? Um, or do we need something more akin to the sky, size of a forest in our buildings? And then on the right is a is a project from Carnegie Mellon and a smith of a Martian greenhouse. So I currently work on a green wall technology at the Yale Center of Ecosystems in Architecture. Uh, this is called AMPS. It's the Active Modular Phytoremediation System, which is a direct uh, descendant of NASA research on bio-regenerating closed habitats. So inside our environments, we use materials that off-gas volatile organic compounds. We have poor uh, indoor air quality for a number of reasons. And this was uh, NASA's attempt in the 70s to start using plants to remediate some of that indoor air. And it has followed on in the built industry on earth for quite a number of years. But perhaps what, we're, what we should think about is to what extent not only um, do these things work for what purpose? Are we talking about only uh, cleaning air? Are we talking about uh, as on the right, this is biomass chamber at NASA Kennedy Space Center growing wheat and crops to feed us. Are we talking about uh, a farm? Are we talking about a wall feature? Are we talking about a green roof, a nature preserve? What scale do we need in order to do what thing? What scale is our relationship with plants? Um, how big is my spaceship? Is a million trees enough for New York City? Do we need the vernal sphere concept on the right to, to really get us to the point where we're actually living in a sort of natural relationship with, uh, with plants? And so understanding these complex ecosystems is in a field in of itself, and it's key to having a circular economy, but perhaps more important is to recognize that this is not sort of going back to nature, but in a lot of ways, it's quite the opposite. Um, it's not only humans becoming dependent on machines, but now entire ecosystems coupled to machines. On the right is uh, Biosphere 2, which was a crew of eight sealed inside two years in nearly 13,000 square meters of forests, deserts, oceans, and farms. I'm comparing it here to John Todd and Mary Jack Todd's living machine, which recycled human waste through uh, biological processes in a greenhouse. Um, but these Edens, don't let them fool you. Biosphere 2 is full with plants and beautiful nature above, but underneath uh, is called the technosphere. And I like this picture of the desert basement or the savanna airlock. I mean, these, uh, these Edens are being controlled by labyrinths of pumps and machines. This building was considered the most sealed in history, but the crew experienced starvation and suffocation while oxygen was being absorbed by the concrete. Um, my project with Yale, the AMP system, also looks like an ecosphere above its beautiful walls of plants, but right below that, right behind that wall is a sort of uh, mess <laughs> of mechanical systems. So, I mean, to what extent are we really talking about being natural? Um, is this what we were going for? If it's not, what is? What's going to be then a new system that's based more on the natural sort of physiochemical cycles of the environment itself and what's more, uh, what's, are we able to actually re sort of release our control of architecture, release our control of these systems and accept something which might die and decay over time? How do we, how do we start to move away from mechanical and into something which is more, which is more natural? Can we actually, can we actually get to the cycles of nature in, in a sort of architecture is a, is a question. So when I see, a, I see a lot of projects that have plants all over them and 
a lot of space architecture projects with the greenhouses at the pumping heart of every of every project where people are tied to their plants, but we have to really start to question ourselves, why did we put them there? And are we actually, are we actually achieving what we said? Are, are using plants for food and air circulation and waste remediation an excuse for the more sort of visceral emotional connection to, uh, to plants? Or are we actually trying to use them in the same ways that they interact and exchange with us on earth? It's just something to think about. And I'll just uh, end a little bit with the role of interdisciplinarity in, in architecture now. Understanding and managing complexity leads us to, the, to sort of the hot topic in architecture today. What is the role of architecture in a world of increasingly interconnected variables? How do we design in our design language when we have more tools, more variables, more data than ever? On the left, we have a suite of tools for earth projects. I'm sure you're all using BIM and different Ecotect and all these different uh, ways of evaluating and measuring our built environment. And on the right, we have similar, very similar tools for space projects. So where is the designer here? Um, I think this interdisciplinary dialogue is actually something we yearn for as educated and curious people. There are real benefits in learning how to learn differently and think differently and, and the reframing of ideas from different perspectives, the way, in, the way a sustainability consultant will see a project is, this, is different than the way an urban planner will see the project is different from the way a marketing person would see the project. Um, so too in space, somebody looking at a project from a communications and data perspective will be totally, uh, might be totally different perspective than somebody's looking at the structure um, parts of the project or the sensors, you know, and how we bring all those people together is sort of actually the beauty uh, of it. And in the space project, there's sort of more and more of these sort of experts, uh, engineers, scientists that get involved and it's sort of more and more exciting. But I think earth architecture is going in that way um, as well. So architecture for space has also been imagined by many different kinds of people. This is a project uh, from the engineer Werner von Braun, um, part of a series called Man's Conquest of Space. Uh, and it's, it's the prototypical Taurus um, design. So he's, this, this is an engineer thinking of this one. Um, that uh, image we saw before of this uh, sort of this Tuscan villa in space, the vernal sphere is designed by physicist, well designed uh, is uh, imagined by physicist Gerard O'Neill. Um, this is perhaps the first to suggest a more biological model. Um, similarly, engineers and scientists together thought up the Stanford Taurus in the 70s. Um, so, and ironically, while those scientists and engineers are designing architecture, Arthur C. Clarke, who is an author, is dreaming up geosynchronous orbit, which is the idea of placing satellites in orbit at a specific distance so that you could get full coverage of global communications. So if you think space is irrelevant, you can put away your cell phone. Uh, um, anyway, in this interdisciplinary atmosphere, where do architects fit in? What is our value? What are we, what, what are we doing there? Are we storytellers? Are we human engineers, social or ergonomic engineers? Are we people who make images or renderings? Do we create inspiration to, Advent to push the sciences and engineers to do better? Are we systems engineers? Um, I think it's pretty evidenced by the fact that there are actually five to 10 people, maybe there are more now who can make a living at this, uh, that it inevitably forces us to articulate to other audiences, what is our value, real or perceived? Um, and that's the same on, in space and earth. What is the value of architecture? So, I, I don't like to claim my value myself or speak for others which work in the field because they all have no doubt their own definitions. And I'm sure I'd love to hear what Michael thinks of this as well. Um, but I would say that regardless of who or what individual or group of collaborative people, we're all interest, invested in designing a vision of the future. Um, and the architect for me has always been a kind of conductor bringing together many disciplines into a holistic picture. This was a, an image we used for one of our, for that Mars X house um, uh, project where, we, where we're showing, we're bringing together human factors, environmental drivers, constructability and mission drivers. We're sort of 
the conductor again. We're demonstrating that the delivery of a building is not simply the technical challenges of autonomous construction. It's not just the mechanical requirements of a life support system. It's not just the material and formal response to environmental factors. It's not just sustainability. It's not just human scale and experience. It's all of those things. And, and architects generally tend to be master integrators and uh, deliver an entire building environment, whether that's on earth or in space. So I hope that this overview of architecture with space applications has started to answer that question, why space for architects and why architects for space? Um, and if we quote astrophysicist Carl Sagan, that's home, that's us, on, e on it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being who ever lived, lived out their lives. It's also everything we've ever designed for, the, the source of all our standards, preconceptions, design thoughts, um, cultures, histories, geographies, climates, and tools, all claim from this planetary environment. And space architecture is a way for us to step back, to zoom out, remove ourselves from context and environment, from culture, from the biological and chemical networks that we're born into and sustained in. Architecture now becomes, comes face to face with what's essential. What is it that we take for granted when we design? What fundamental questions, assumptions do we make about our environment? What will we have, uh, what will we have to question and what do we have to toss out? In the void, the only space for our existence is inside our built environment, inside a piece of architecture acting as a surrogate for all of Earth's resources, history and culture. So as we leave our planet, we become critically aware of our dependence on it and to what extent we and our, our design mentality, our bodies and our culture are, are tied to it. And so in this extreme context of space, we're offered a lens by which to reimagine how we live and design for Earth. And I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, I have a question for Sandra before we sort of get into a discussion. Um, and maybe we'd invite the students questions first. Um, are the students in this ro uh, room? Uh, are they uh, studying architecture or space architecture? Or are they uh, uh, looking for a, a, a focus in their in their degree? Um, the students in this room are all architects. Okay. In their master studies, most of them have not heard about space architecture before this module. Now they have already heard a, a lot of it. There are a few students that are interested in it. Okay. Um, and some of them, maybe Shil wants to say something. And because he had a design studio last year on a Mars project. Okay, and was that with you? Was that studying with you? Yes, and Christine, okay. you are also part of our studio, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, because you are such a well, well renowned uh, uh, space architect yourself. So I thought maybe this is a space architecture course. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is not. They are usually in the summer. But so that in winter, there is a series that uh, is called Module Emerging Fields in Architecture. It's broader uh -huh. and fits very much to what Christina said. You know, it's looking at different professions, technologies, views. Uh, we have lecturers, not only architects. Yesterday, we had a lecture from Peter Sellers, uh, the theater regisseur. You know him probably from the US. Yes. And in the summer term, we have a design studio. Okay. That is especially on development of a particular topic issue. But maybe I give my word or my microphone to the students and some of the students would like to answer your question. Okay, thank you. That means anyone. <laughs> raises his hand or just speaks. So who is the student that uh, had your, uh, your studio course? The Mars, the Mars Habitat? Jill. 
Yes, I've been in that studio. <laughs> um, and what did you what did you produce? Uh, was it a group project or an individual project? Well, it was I did it with a partner, so with a student. And well, I can show you if you want to, but I have to switch to my computer there. <laughs> Uh, and also Alma, Alma, I haven't seen you. You have also, you're also an experienced space architect. Yeah. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. So you, also... did a, you did a Mars habitat on the surface or what was the assignment? Uh, the first step was uh, um, building the habitat and then uh, later moving on to the city on Mars. I see. Was it, was it, did it involve uh, in situ resources or? 3D printing? We all decided for ourselves what we uh, thought was the best. Um, most of us did use the materials on, on Mars. Okay. And um, some also used 3D printed in, or inflatable or a combination of both. And it was very interesting. I just participated in the final review of a studio at the University uh, in Munster. Um, where the professor who's part of the 3D printing industry gave a 3D printed uh, habitat assignment for Mars. So I'm, I'm, but it was a very short, what they did in th th four weeks was astounding. How much they learned and uh, how much they produced. So I was a little bit intimidated because my students have been working on a project for a whole term, meaning three months. I uh -huh. think they have produced less. <laughs> How much time did you spend on these projects? Uh, we've spent a whole semester. Um, last semester, it was very which intense. Means, it which was, means uh, three uh, months or six yes, months? Or, yes. Yeah, okay. No, three, three months, okay. yes. It was very interesting. Yeah, because you have a lot to learn, right, when you realize that uh, there's so much so you have to rethink. You can't assume yep. that we, as we do on earth. So I would like to ask that yeah. question. Maybe that's a good question to begin. When you guys go to space, does it really influence when you come back to earth and do a terrestrial project? Like if you did a space project last term, are you doing something on earth this term and did the thinking of going into space and thinking about that, when you came back, does it affect the way that you think about building here or projecting something to be built on Earth? For me, yes, of course. Um, I'm doing a studio now, it's, uh, this semester, um, it's building on Earth. And um, it's like I have to go back to Earth now um, to think in, in Earth physics again. and. Uh, I would like to do uh, actually a space space architecture. <laughs> you want to float again, which is yes. funny because that's what the that's what the astronauts often say about coming off the ISS. The two most favorite things they do are looking at the cupola, um, looking at Earth, and floating. Like Chris yeah. Hatfield in particular said, the most ama amazing thing was I'd give anything to float again. Um, you know, so it's just that sort of uh, free from gravity was just an extraordinary um, condition to be in. <laughs> Interesting. <clears throat> anyway, I mean, so that goes, uh, that goes back to Christina, who's sort of trying to occupy both worlds simultaneously. Um, you know, a mm -hmm. lot of her conversation was really like being in both having one foot in both worlds at the same time. I like your, I like the quote you always bring up, Michael, about the, that the earth is in the heavens. You know, that it's not, we have to remember that it's, it's still, we're still in space here on earth for the same Bucky Fuller's comment, you know, we're astronauts on board mm -hmm. earth. It's all physics and it's all physics and chemistry. And it's just in a different, just in various different environments. Well, I like, I love Bucky Fuller. You know, I was a big Bucky Fuller fan when Bucky Fuller wasn't uh, fashionable. Um, <laughs> there was a period of time where the students may not know when we went to school, you couldn't do, well, I mean, my generation anyway, and I'm a little bit older than everybody else in the room. Um, 
you couldn't pursue this type of work because we were caught between the 70s, 1970s, when there was the last big environmental movement and maybe the heyday of the biosphere and Bucky Fuller, the sort of pinnacle of that influence. And then there was the 1980s, which was this big shift back towards postmodernism and a kind of uh, a different sort of humanism and pulling back and trying to make sort of architectural meaning um, in relationship to uh, symbolism or other types of form, formalism. Um, so you couldn't really, I was very much brought up in an environmental movement and very conscious of that as a younger teenager. But then when I got to college, that kind of uh, aspect of pursuing environmental strategies or what I would like to refer to as topophilia, like being in love with the earth mm -hmm. and the kind of systems of natural systems of earth was not considered, uh, was considered a leftover and very unfashionable. So it's, it's interesting that to not only to think about these things, but it's also interesting to think about them in the relative context of what the global um, trend is, what the global focus is, how it's okay to think about these things. Because when I, again, in the eighties, when I was studying, I had to really physically resist the kind of forces that were asking me to look at things I didn't want to look at. And I really wanted to be involved with a kind of more of an environmental um, strategy, but there was nobody, there was nobody to talk to uh, about it. So I was a latent uh, Buckminster Fuller fan, but even then I sort of said, there's got to be something more than the sort of mechanism. You know, yes. Fuller always tried to solve the problems. It was like problem solving mentality. And I didn't think it was a problem to solve. I thought it was always a situation to embrace um, rather than worry about, you know, uh, cycles of life and death. You know, I think you just had to embrace them. Whereas Fuller was always, a lot of his mapping strategies were always about, you know, slave and slaves, uh, and, you know, people that were serving and served and how do we, create balance. And I think that that notion of imbalance was something that I was more interested in embracing, uh, the kind of entropy that Robert Smithson refers to that everything is in constant, you know, renewal and, uh, and maybe also degradation that it's beginning to just, it's renewing and destroying at the same time. So it's a, a more of a cycle and to try to understand that. And I think that's, you know, Going back to Christina's lecture, I think that that's a question that I have the, in these mechanized systems yeah. is there's no opportunity for bacteria. Yeah. <laughs> no, and that's it's... like relative to the pandemic time. I think like, how do we create the space for bacteria? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that's why I brought up those images is, you know, I think we think that, you know, putting plants in buildings is some kind of like return to nature. And it's really not. It's really a, it's at the moment, it's, it's an expression of how much control we still need to have. Still want to have over our buildings, how we don't accept that sort of cycles, as you said, of the imbalance. Like we're not, somehow we've come to a particular point in time where we're not able to except that the inside of our building might be anything other than 18 degrees and, and sunny. Um, and how, how do we do make space for those things? How do we make space for bacteria, good bacteria, probiotic bacteria, life in other forms rather than oh. just a sort of monoculture? Uh, you know, I think that starts with, um, it starts with how we value things. So, you know, you'll talk to a very practically, you talk to a person, a builder, developer, owner about putting plants in their buildings, they're going to have questions about mold and bacteria and, you know, what's it going to do to my maintenance costs. And if you, you have to sort of reframe where you place value, um, you can, instead of, you can say, instead of your mechanical systems, which use a lot of energy, maybe these plants will start to, uh, uh, remediate your air quality. Maybe they'll offer better humidity control. Maybe they're going to um, 
provide some noise abatement in the building and you start to include all these other factors and variables that we talk about when we value systems. But can we start to talk about, I don't like to use the word biophilia, but like, is there something else, um, you know, rather than sort of the hard tax of like value, like the solution driven value, like, you know, give me the bottom line number on what's it gonna do to my energy costs. Like, is there some way we can start to value something else in architecture, you know? And on the one hand, we value culture and design and beauty, and we put a very high price tag on that. That's, then it's not available to sort of a larger, wider audience. But if there's a way that we could talk about value and, and include that also in sort of the, in the, um, the standards and regulations that we have on buildings, so, you know, that would start to include more biological solutions or more or solutions that are not necessarily maniacally uh, maniacally number driven or uh, maniacally controlled. Michael? Michael? Yes. Which, uh, what, uh, I would like to know, I was interested when you said, you, you were forced to be interested in two, some specific topics and you had to really put a lot of energy into it, not uh, to follow what others expected you to learn. What was that? At the there, was a big, there was a big push to look at Italian classical references in your building and, uh, you know, to literally open the book and look at the facades of famous Italian uh, precedents, Renaissance or classical precedents, mostly Renaissance um, or, or post-Renaissance uh, kind of facade, Giulio Romano or whatever. They were like, like open the book and make a, you know, make a quotation, you know, sort of in the vein of, I don't know who we were imitating because it just was really offensive to me. And I was always a little bit of a modernist and maybe even a kind of Bucky Fuller kind of environmental modernism. And it was just so unfashionable to look at that at the time of the early eighties in New York architectural vanguard education. They wanted to, everybody wanted to look at these uh, things. So, I mean, if Michael Graves was the most famous architect at the time um, in America, you can imagine what the influence was. Aldo Rossi was less of a classicist, I think, but the way that the Americans saw him was very um, imitation, uh, you know, looking to fit into the sort of uh, context of uh, pare down classical architecture um, and, and, re and referential to quotational of uh, buildings. And so there was a whole discussion about precedent literally meaning um, a kind of within the language of, of, of pure formal architecture that you were beginning to not only speak to society, but that you were beginning to speak and quote uh, other important um, things. So it's not until my maturity, as I get more and more white hair, do I actually even appreciate a lot of classical architecture? So it took me a long time to um, understand the, what was maybe being offered intellectually then, I just saw it as being a little bit uh, uh, forcing uh, in me, me into a mold that I didn't want to fit into as a, as a student. So I wasn't a very successful student during this time because I didn't do what my teachers wanted me to do. And then when I did it, I did it very cynically, almost like Rem Koolhaas is a very cynical architect to me. And I did it and I like showed them I could do it even better than they could um, by, in, by bringing in even Asian influences. So I was like classical things with Asian influences. So it was, it was bizarre, um, but it was really like this uh, Charles Moore, uh, anything goes kind of uh, attitude towards and maybe and maybe to some degree, it was also like a little bit Dadaist, like maybe it was a little bit like Ettore Sotsas and, and Memphis, um, this kind of idea of, of uh, collage or um, kind of dysfunction 
um, it was an interesting nihilistic, uh, <laughs> nihilistic sort of time. It wasn't sort of, it wasn't sort of proactive or addressing the earth. Do you think that we're now sort of being forced to look at environmental issues and data and technology? Do you think that that's the sort of driver of the moment? Well, I'm against any kind of lead lead certification because <laughs> I have to laugh because a famous architectural friends of mine designed a building, a swimming, an indoor swimming pool that did not have an air conditioning system. Mm -hmm. And they could not get a, I mean, it's a, like a platinum, double, triple platinum lead rated building. And they could not get lead certification yeah. because they did not have an air conditioner. Yeah. And so I just thought, I just thought it was the irony of irony that people are supposed to lead is this, uh, I don't know if you have it in uh, Austria. Um, Christina can explain it, what that acronym means, but um it's a, it's a standard of, of getting maybe a tax incentive for your client. Um, it's always about money at the end of the day yeah. um, to reducing through building construction means and methods, the consumption or the impact that a building has on thing. I mean, I know you have very strict codes in Europe, but it wasn't, it's also leading people to sort of this checklist mentality, like did yeah. this, did this, did this, did this. Yeah. And it's really what happened to design in the 70s, which led to postmodernism as a reaction against the sort of green environmental architecture that was so unesthetic and so uh, ugly in many cases, vi uh, uh, visually, that it forced people into this other avenue, which was also a false start. So I worry about governmental oversights as opposed to <laughs> as opposed to just human common sense that you would do something that would be meaningful and lastful and efficient and organized rather than being sort of told to do it because so many people don't want to think even in architecture and they just have this checklist mentality. So I find the, I, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a, a, a libertarian in terms of a, like, I don't like regulations, um, but well, I, I understand why they're needed and guidelines. But at the same time, I think that people just live, live to those and the standards are very low. I, I, I agree with you, Michael. And I think that this gets, this is kind of what I meant by changing the value system, you know, instead of having people check the boxes or, um, you know, sign on the bottom line, how much it's going to cost or what's my energy usage or whatever. How do you refocus the conversation on, on value and what you get out of this building and what you get out of whatever that you're, whatever you're doing to it, whether that's passive design or putting plants in or whatever it is that like reframing the conversation on value is sort of where I would, where, where I would go on in terms of like, instead of checking the, instead of checking the lead boxes, lead is leadership and energy and environmental design. Which I'm, I think there's several other European standards for that, but yeah, the the checklist and the standards are a particular way of looking at how to evaluate buildings, how to communicate the value of what you did to your clients or to people to say like, here we, you know, look, we gave it value. But if you were able to talk about it in a different way, more holistic way, um, more perhaps more common sense, as you said that you know, we have a wider available range of solutions and we don't have to reduce it to like, you know, my, my building envelope is tight, so, or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it goes sort of brings yeah, me back to the, sort of the, yeah, sorry. Just one second, because we have about 20 minutes left. Uh -huh. And I would like to ask the students if they have some questions to what Christina said in her lecture. Um, have some question. Please, Fabian. Uh, first of all, regarding to your question, if we as students feel this, for, for myself personally, I do feel free. And this uh, pretty much reminded me on what Peter Salat said yes, <clears throat> yesterday about the pressure and not giving in onto the pressure. Uh, anyhow, back to the question. I was somehow reminded on the echo fears, echo fears from 
from NASA when you mentioned uh, enclosed environments and biological aspects. So I was wondering if maybe these uh, maybe these factors or researching them could somehow yeah it's it's hard to describe but somehow um, define the space for humans so researching the factors for the system could somehow yeah I think, you know, even deciding what factors you're going to evaluate uh, are sort of the starting point. What's the question you want to ask about the plants? Do you want to ask the plants to provide you? I don't know. I'm just putting, I'm just using the plants as an example, but I think it applies to a lot of things. Was As designers, we get to set up what the question is before we get to answer the question. <laughs> um, so if you were going to inv investigate plants, you want to ask it, are these plants for food? Are they going to remediate your waste? Are they going to provide you with clean air inside your building? Are they going to reduce the urban heat island effect? There are many other things that we've attributed to, uh, to these natural or biological systems. And so allowing a space where we can ask all of those questions at once and perhaps um, provide uh, not I don't know that Michael is anti the word solution. I'm trying to come up with a different word than solution. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> provide di different uh, uh, different kinds of different ways of um, changing our environment because buildings buildings change the environment uh, or create an environment that we can uh, that research needs to be done. Um, there are lots of skeptics. Uh, I'll just quote that the, the EPA will say that the that plants can't provide that kind of remediation at scale. So we can't we can't possibly put in enough plants in the buildings that would possibly reduce the need for ventilation systems, for example. We could just open your window, but that's also not considered in their rubrics. <laughs> um, but yes, so m research is needed. But in fact, even prior to doing the research on plant like like the physical experiments of putting plants in a building, in an in-situ environment, in, in a like physical environment of a building, not just the laboratory scale. Prior to doing any kind of those experiments, we should also ask, like, what, is, what is it we're asking of the plants? What is the experimental variable that we're trying to test? Or what is it that we're, what, what exactly are we researching or, experiment, or experimenting, experimenting with them to do? And so what is sort of the whole laundry list of things, whether it's energy, air um, remediation, waste remediation, food, whatever it is, what is it that we we want to put into sort of that experimental framework to research so that we can then communicate well, that value back to our clients. Look at all the things that they did or, uh, you know, look at the ways they could influence the world. And, and I would include biophilia and sort of human connection to nature as one of those variables. I don't know how exactly you might test them, maybe with a psychology lab involved, but um, you know, yes, those hopefully setting up that research framework can sort of influence how buildings will be if we can sort of bring back more biology into our, into our human environments. That answer the question. Has there been a lot of study about not just bringing plants into an interior, but bringing interior into plants, like the reverse? Like, I mean, because now in this pandemic time, we have a need for outdoor space. We realize that the thing, so like culturing outdoor space that we can spend more time in, like yeah. we can temper it, like these same architects I refer to about the air conditioner, Williams and Chen, they also design a lot of outdoor spaces in cold climates such as that you might find in Austria, um, that you can actually be outside in the winter and have uh, like a ten like it's a microclimate to create microclimates yes. in very cold environments that are occupiable full year round. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's much more difficult to sort of test outside environments, but uh, because of all the, the variables and factors. Um, but absolutely, we should be looking at that as well. Like how do we have, how does the natural environment around us then, you know, 
have an effect on the building and humans and how can we get outside more basically how do we get outside more right this is the mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We, how do we learn not to only you know shelter inside of our 18 degrees and sunny inside all the time but it, learn to live with variability mm-hmm. maybe so i think it's i think it's harder in some way to bring the outdoors in as opposed to bring the indoors out in some way. Yeah, yeah. Is there any other question? Fabian, do you have a follow-up question or was this okay? Okay. I also have a question, maybe later. No, I'm not asking. Fine, please. Okay. I wanted to ask about um, architecture, like how uh, would architecture change in lower gravity, for example, on Mars, but in relation to human body, um, for example, like um, what what would be the also the natural movements of the body in this lower G, um, of starting from zero gravity in, in spaceship <clears throat> and then continuing to low gravity on Mars? And how would architecture support that? And I'll, I, Michael, you can. I'll just say one one thing is that we have some now many years of experience in zero gravity, and we have had uh, a lot of experience on how to move in space and how you need sort of hand grabs and and. Um, you can and we can study the various extensive motion. We don't have as much research available on other alternative gravities on the moon. We have a bit, but as you can see there, their gait changed on the moon, obviously like bouncing. And you can imagine that that has an incredible effect on what kind of interior space you might need. I mean, they might need a whole lot more space just to walk. You know, we might <laughs> think that going downstairs and earth you know, whatever the, the ratio is, 11-7 to the it, it stairs on Earth, doesn't work at all on the moon. It's completely different. Um, you might be able to leap up to your bedroom. You don't even need, you don't even need stairs or uh, such. But we don't really have that, we don't really have that research in partial gravity. And uh, we have zero research on what it means to be in Mars gravity so far. But I would imagine that, that it would have... Mm, a lot of effects on the range of motion. Obviously, the, the dimensions of the human body itself doesn't change, but we can start. I would imagine. I would think that we could start to think about sort of silent moments in the in the human body. So times that we don't move very much, sleeping, looking at a computer, whatever, versus transitional moments where we have to move um, and where it's more dynamic, and how the relationship between what those functional areas are would, might be completely different now whether or not you could convince uh a spacefaring agency uh like ESO or nasa to change the way that we've looked at architecture and imagine that like you might need more space or it's totally different that that would be interesting because there isn't the i guess there's not the research enough to support it but but you can imagine how they might just transport literally an architecture that's right for earth literally take it to Mars or the moon in another gravity and, and say, well, we're going to build it just like that because that's what we know. And that would completely not function. And to, but to get, to get this to the point where we can, we can influence how we might be able to, how we might be advocate for a sort of architect, a different architectural perspective would probably require research would probably require physically people, uh, you know, living in that gra- gravity and, and reporting back that this isn't, our earth norms don't work anymore. Uh, Michael, what do you think? <laughs> well, I, I think that in general, they say that the the Martian gravity, one third gravity is okay. It won't, won't de- uh, cause deterioration, will be, will be fine. Human beings will, ad- you know, there are adaptation and our systems won't be, you know, hugely affected by it. But anything less than that, is the kind of uh, you know lunar gravity or zero gravity of transit? Um, microgravity is causes huge uh, biological deterioration without counteractivity, bone loss, and all these factors. So I, I think that's the first thing. And then I think that the relationship of habitation and the way that at least NASA looks at it, or some part people at NASA looks at it, is in commonality. So that there isn't a lot of, tr- you know, currently a lot of training that goes between living in a microgravity mm-hmm. environment 
and then what could be similar in a you know in a third or a sixth gravity environment so there, there's less transitional adjustment in the sort of orientation or in the location of goods or where the kitchen is in relationship so there's a kind of familiarity of uh, of common structures that is also looked at so it's a kind of a you know a strange um combination i agree with what christina is saying that we just don't have they don't make the test beds everything is tested on earth and it's kind of almost uh a little bit ridiculous when you go into some of these things that they have even in the bellies of NASA. And you're like, that's an Ikea table. And they're like, yeah, we'll do. And I was like, well, no, in space, you need to have a very special table. Um, so it's unusual. I mean, Christina worked at NASA for uh, a while, so she could talk more to that. But um, it's, a, it's a curious situation that you would think that they would have more, um, uh, extensive analysis studies about, you know, ergonomics in these kind of conditions. But I think it's an it's opportunity for the future. So if you're interested in moving into that arena, I think there's lots of knowledge that you can bring as an architect, as Christina referred to, the multi hats of an architect. You can really look at the problem more holistically than sometimes engineers who are very focused on their own specific topic and don't have a broader understanding of looking at a bigger picture. And that, that's what I mean about assumptions. So when we, you know, when we're designing, we make a lot of assumptions already about, like, you know, this is about, this is the size of a bed and this is the size of a table and this is the size of a room. And that's, just, you know, that's based on a lot of things that we've just taken for granted. And, and that's why it's, this whole theme of, of this lecture is really about like, looking very hard at those assumptions that we make and when you put it into space you're you're automatically like well where did that come from why is that why is that ikea table good enough like where did they where did they come up with those dimensions and that design from and how come and now how it's totally now something different when you put it into a different context and like you know how come you don't just transport the exact dimensions of your house to the space station like the you like, where did that all come from? And how you get an opportunity now that you're looking at a completely different environment to really question, like, whoa, what, what did I, where did I get all those design influences from? Is that true? Um, how can I rethink it now that I'm presented with a completely different reality? Well, let's, let's, let's get the opportunity to start from the beginning, to start from scratch. Let me add something to it, Anna. Um, I think there are maybe there are two, two ways how to look at it. The physical background, you know, because my, gravity is a strong force, a very strong force. And everything on Earth is, has developed or is because of the gravity like it is. So if you take it away, if you change it, um, all the physical parama parameters will change. Big, a big, a, it will be a big change. And they had some very good uh, examinations on the Skylab space station. They measured the changes in the body, you know, really the angles. And you have seen this uh, famous image of the natural body position of fish, and it, that you can yeah. see the head is tilted and the arms float like this. That is the position that you can hold without putting any force to the muscles. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to move your hands down, you have to use muscles. And this has direct implications for the design of anything, you know, of cupboards, tables, stairs, because the body position has changed. And with this physical measurements on Skylab, there was a interpolation for lunar gravity. So what Christina said is that you need higher rooms because you jump higher you can also not stop immediately, you know? That means you need uh, a longer space before the stair starts, otherwise uh, you fall down. Mm -hmm. and, but after some time, people found out that these body position interpolations are just not uh, valued, uh, not guilty, not guilty, not applicable to everyone. Because it was based on, six, on three astronauts, six astronauts. 
You know, six astronauts were the reason why all the other put their um, uh, interpolations on that. And they had an, a follow-up study. And in, this, in the study, there was a range, you know, the head is tilted down, but not exactly the degrees as the people, the engineers would like to have seen. So there is this one part that is uh, important to research, important to get knowledge of. It's mathematically, physically, um, to get new data on what you don't know how it will be. And then the other question is, and it relates also to Christina's uh, lecture, is culture. Because you cannot get rid of where you come from. When you go to the space station, you take with you uh, 25 years of your family history, your cultural history, and what you have learned is right or wrong. So for example, and at the Skylab, there's one famous example that also they could use the space in all directions, upside down, and they did use it. They refused to float over the table because this was seen unpolite. And this is not something that they discussed not to do. They just didn't do it. And mm -hmm. another thing that happened during the Skylab, because there was a lot of uh, different um, installations, is that they found out that the human body is, is, it is best that if you work at a workstation, that everything is aligned to one uh, gravity center. So the, the, the so that you don't have to change uh, orientation while you're working. It, within one frame or with on, within one workstations, they found out it is better and more effective to have one gravity, even if you could put everything in, in any direction. So mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to say that because it's important to be creative and to think behind, you know, what behind the miracle, behind the obstacle, what we heard. Um, and at the same time, you have to be aware of the standards, right? You cannot break rules if you don't know the rules. That's a bit, that, that's a difficult thing. You know, follow the rules, learn the rules and not following them and breaking them. Uh, th this was my question. If before Milumir, Milumir, you are the next. I, I, I promise, is related to what Michael said when he was studying. How do you feel when you study? Do you feel that you are in a school and you learn something that adds uh, adds up in your brain, or do you feel that you learn to become what you want to be? Are you asking the students or the... Yes, no, 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 I'm asking the students. You, for uh -huh. example. Oh, okay, me. Well, um, I don't know. I've been educating myself for the, a, a big part of my life now. Um, um, I'm 31. Um, and um, so I've been really educating myself for a long time now. Um, I do not have a feeling that I'm um, sitting in school and learning something because I have to. I just kind of like to choose what I learn and um, I don't know, try to imagine that I would maybe need it in the future and that it would somehow come handy. And it had actually for them so far. So, yes. Well, I would say um, uh, it was a free choice for me to to start studying architecture. So in that way, it was like a few flexible and free. But like the bachelor program is still a little bit like you have to do this and this, uh, whether you want or not. But I think there's still some loopholes in that one way you can say, OK, don't want to really focus on that lecture. I just skip all the things and write the exam and pass it somewhere. and give it like this way if you want to. But um, I think like the master's program that we have is 
like really a free one and you can really choose what you want to do and also if you don't like what you're doing you can still um say that you don't want to do it in in, in a way you can ask uh, around and say hey I, this is really not what i'm into uh i want to do something different and i did good experience in in, in that one and yeah i think it's also a, um you're learning there's a process of, of, of learning in at, at at university that that you can resist and you don't need to do what everyone tells you what you should do and at the end you're doing it only for yourself and not for anybody else so that came to my mind like a year ago and since that i'm feeling quite flexible and free i have to say I think that's I think that's great because uh, yeah I did I didn't feel so uh, obviously I didn't feel so I mean I was resistant uh, my 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 education was com helped me a great deal in many cases but I was also resistant to um, the status quo um, throughout thing and then I went to Cooper Union after this experience with or initially studying architecture and um, it was actually the reverse. The Dean was John Haydock, who was a very famous American architect and educator. Um, and he actually instructed us to resist um, the profession. <laughs> so to do a counter counter profession uh, as a practice um, because he saw the profession uh, in its normative sense uh, he saw that as a, as a, uh, as a negative. In, 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 in architects going to produce uh, buildings without thinking. Mm, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, so I have got a question uh, concerning the presentation. In one of the slides that were shown a big tree in a, in a, in a huge dome on Mars. And I was wondering if um, this tree uh, cycles through the seasons. You know, uh, back on Earth, we, we celebrate the nature, uh, the constant change as um, vacation of time. And um, I'm wondering how it is to be years on another planet or in an enclosed space without uh, the sense of time and change and how we can cope with that. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's, it goes back to this question of how much we want to control our environment. And I mean, if you imagine you're as, you know, most of us are indoors a lot of the time, our environment is the same. It's the same temperature. It's the same air quality. It's sort of the same inside all the time. If we didn't look out the window and see the sort of change or, and maybe in Europe, you have more of control over whether or not you're able to open the window and have a sort of connection rather than sort of, only being in your hermetically closed air conditioning building. But it is an amazing question to, can we rep, like if we had seasons on Mars, in fact, there are seasons on Mars uh, outside, which are quite more extreme. Uh, you just get cold and a little bit colder and even more cold. Uh, it doesn't quite get to summer state, but um, you know, there are external seasons, but if you wanted to maintain your tree are you talking about now making artificially seasons, which is that the point of what we were trying to do? I mean, if, if the point was sort of a, a connection to nature and, and like the, the, the changes, the natural changes and the natural cycles of, of our planet, then anything that you're doing inside of a dome on Mars to sort of replicate it would naturally be artificial. Um, so is that really, is that really getting to what you wanted to do, which is to be connected to your planet and to, to say, well, let's turn the air conditioner up or down and change the change our environment inside. It's still control. So, you know, how do we how do we sort of let go of control on Earth and allow ourselves to maybe experience it because we can on Earth. It's very hard to do in space to let, let go of control because you die. But <laughs> on earth, we have a little bit more of a leeway to say, you know, like I'm okay with opening my window and it's cold today inside, or it's, you know, I'm okay, you know, it's really hot and let's, you know, let's have cross ventilation so I get some breeze or I'm gonna just be okay with being really hot today. 
you know, take my, take my jacket off. Um, so I think it's about looking inside and asking what's, what is it about seasons and, and like the change that's, that is important. What's at the root of that idea? And is it the same if I just have artificially recreate that somewhere else? Or what am I, what was actually, am I missing when I do that? No, it's just sort of going inside and questioning those, those inside beliefs. You might, you might ask somebody in California if they miss the seasons, maybe they don't, you know, so they're like sunny and warm constantly all, <laughs> all around. So that's another question is, you know, culturally biased, are you culturally biased towards that versus somebody else who lives in a more equatorial environment who doesn't have the change? In any case, it's about to what extent we, are we artificially recreating nature versus allowing for in our lack or allowing for a sort of release of control. Yeah. I'd love to have fall on the on Mars. I'm sure to be beautiful. <laughs> well actually you. you do you do have seasons on Mars, yeah. but um, yeah. you know especially in the equatorial zone, um, it's a little bit more severe obviously day to night, <laughs> day to night temperatures, but it does get up to 65 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm told, uh, in the summer, uh, yeah. in the equatorial zone. So that's, uh, that's like it is in, in many parts of the world that doesn't really uh, reach higher temperatures. Right, so that's like allowing you to actually be a part of what's happening on the planet of Mars rather than recreating the planetary seasons of, of Earth somewhere else, which would be great. I mean, you, if, again, if you were to, you know, have a habitat above ground, which is connected with views and light to the natural, to the, mm -hmm. to the Martian landscape, you actually get to be a part of the experience of what, it, what nature is on Mars mm -hmm. rather than wholly sort of recreating our ideas. Well, I guess that's the whole idea when they had this big Mars show, I don't know, about 15 years ago at the Natural History Museum here in New York, that they finished with the end section, which had to do with um, uh, uh, making a Earth-like uh, surface to terraforming Mars. And they made it look like a pastoral Earth. And I just thought it was so bizarre <laughs> that even the landscape architecture even if you were going to terraform it and make it look more like earth, it, in my mind, it should look like a landscape that nobody's ever seen before because it's sort of the combination of being on Mars and, and uh, introducing this crossbreed of plants that would just grow an entirely different way um, and find their own cycles and their own you know, survival of the fittest type of thing. That but would it, be just, it just was truly bizarre. Sometimes that visionary projects look like the past before they're even, they're supposed to be futuristic, but I find them very nostalgic, um, which is a lot, you know, it's the Bernal, the, 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 the Taurus is something like, you know, I want to believe it in some way, but I also find it very nostalgic looking like it's a vision of the future that's already, uh, not the future. So I think the Tuscany, is... the Tuscany Hills in space. <laughs> Beautiful. It's, it's, but it's I love your like, idea. It's kind of not the way I would imagine that that would evolve anyway. So why can't, yeah. like, we need a visionary imagination that is not maybe uh, a landscape that we know. I, I love, I love that. And I think you're totally right. That let, let's let these plants decide what nature is, like what seasons are for them, you know, give them, you need, I guess at the moment you, they need still some air and light, uh, but let, let that evolve to see what it is for them. Do they, do they respond? Maybe that's, maybe that's more of the question that, that we were getting from, from the student before. Can yeah, they, like why not? Why not? Re why not respect the terrain that we inherited? I mean, it's like yeah. you, you kind of like, do we have to, you know, make everything in our own image? And I think that's all. What some of the problems, conceptual problems that we have here on Earth, that we, we assume that everything has to be in a modern, contemporary comfort zone, and even my own parents didn't grow up that way. So I mean. 
is it sort of normal that we should accept these things or um, should we put ourselves in, you know, should we have to put a, uh, a sweater on or a j jacket on in the winter because we shouldn't heat our houses <laughs> so extensively? <laughs> I, I don't know how it is in Europe, but I know that when I went to offices in, in the US in the summer, I had to put my jacket on when I got inside the office because it was so cold, the air conditioning was blowing so cold to keep it, you know, at the correct temperature. And then like it took, and then when I got outside, I'd have to take my jacket off again because it was warm and sunny inside. Um, I think we are blessed in Europe, <laughs> uh, or at least in Austria. I have the feeling we're a lot outside now, even more than before. Um, so this is good. Like today is a beautiful day outside, sunny. It's cold, but it's sunny, beautiful autumn colors. Um, we are running out of time. So we could have one last question or comment. And then we have to say goodbye. Okay. Is there any issue you would like to state, ask any of you? Um, then I leave Christina and Michael the possibility to say a few last words, if you like. Christina, I thought it was interesting given all of your mechanical stuff and then the Mars X house thing, um, in our video, there was a whole separation of the uh, mechanical zones between the laboratory and the habitat, which was, I think, a very significant factor in that design that uh, interestingly you omitted in your presentation today, uh, probably intentionally, but, uh, um, you know, that, that sort of system, integrated systems. And I think that's a really interesting opportunity in the future, what, this, what your lecture to me sort of says that architects need to play a much more uh, um, knowledgeable role um, in the integration of these mechanical systems, the awareness of them, rather than, you know, at students, I used to be like, oh, that is so boring. I mean, I was interested in it, but nobody taught it to me in an interesting way, like the past passive systems. So I find I have a difficulty with closed, uh, you know, these uh, what you call net zero housing or a thing because they don't allow any air exchange. It's yeah, very yeah. problematic to me. But I find that the sort of balance between the things that you can't see, such as the quality of the air which is gonna become more and more uh, understood through the pandemic. Um, like how do, we, how do we actually cultivate the air in a better way? And how do we live more uh, in, in awareness with mechanical systems? Um, and you know, as we become more cyborg ourselves as human beings, how do we you know, extend that humanism towards these mechanical systems? as opposed to just mechanizing biological systems, how do we humanize the mechanical? I think that's an interesting opportunity for, for anybody to think about and look at. Because I always said that the, the future in architecture was in control systems, like in, in how the, the buildings are controlled. Um, and that's a, whether we have a microchip in our, inserted that sort of for you sort of said, okay, wherever Christina is in the building, she doesn't have to wear a jacket because it's cold in the air conditioning. <laughs> and that is very tailored. And I think that's the future. I think that space architecture could lead itself to a more uh, individually microclimated sort of environment for people that brings them the sort of maximum comfort and efficiency based on what their biology is. So I, I do think there's a, there's a play to happen in technology and thing, but it's one that is actually more humanizing rather than something that is invasive. Yeah, I, I agree. And I mean, ironically, 
you know, I've gotten, I, I talked a lot of, obviously a lot about mechanical systems and a lot about sort of life in the machine, also the construction, construction with autonomous machines. Um, and ironically, I would hope that we get to a situation where we're much more able to be physicists than engineers, if it makes sense, that where we're able to you much in the way than the a Native American habitat, like passively sculpted materials and form to create uh, interior environments through basic physics and chemistry and biology. Can we can we do the same in our future habitats? Can we can we sort of tamp down the sort of mechanism and sort of reimagine the, the physics and the biology and the chemistry and make it much more seamless, much more not let's say humanizing, but sort of earthizing, sort of make a make places which are able to operate the way that the earth operates without without having to rely on sort of pumps and wires and brute force to push it all together. Um, and so I would hope that in a, if we were to bring a sort of a, an earth package to Mars or to space in general, that it would be a much more beautifully functioning machine in terms of its own, in terms of the its own elements and properties without without all the pumps and gears and and, um, and energy uh, that's my hope and that hopefully when we do that we can take it back to earth and say this is how we're meant to live with earth this is how we're meant to live in a sort of harm in a, in a way that's uh, in harmony with the natural rhythms and cycles of earth rather than again i mean like for instance, we had to, for the students' benefit, we had to overcome this hyperboloid shape in that Mars X house version two. We, we were so worried that everybody said, oh, it looks like a nuclear reactor. <laughs> well, nuclear reactors act in a certain, the shape of them actually is for the airflow um, in the coolant. And actually it's a kind of prejudices that I think that we need to also overcome even in formal kind of associations with shapes. Yeah. and things because actually it proved to be a, a very efficient shape for, to deal with the pressure, but it also could prove to be a very efficient shape in terms of negotiating in a more passive way, the airflow without the needs for duct ducting or pipes or forcing air. But if there is a sort of relationship of a softer fan that could deal with the uh, uh, less gravity, but could also increase the, the airflow. So I think that that's a kind of, uh, you know, our own built-in prejudices, like, oh my God, everybody's gonna say it looks like a nuclear reactor. And hopefully you don't see a nuclear reactor when you see it, but uh, that was also our concern. <laughs> or, or you realize that nuclear reactor is shaped that way for a reason. And that's also another sort of theme of this lecture is like things evolved in a certain way for a reason, responding to particular environmental factors or technologies or, and, and once we're able to see a thing in terms of, or see a building or a urban place or a spaceship in terms of its lineage of, you know, how we came there, what kind of, what kind of physics and design principles went into it, what kind of cultural biases and everything went into it. We're sort of able to see a thing differently and to then, and to question it and to say, okay, well now, now that we're in a different context, what are the physical principles and the technological principles? And do they, which apply and which don't? And what does this new thing look like? What, what emerges, what evolves um, from that new environment? That is a nice final <laughs> saying. Uh, thank you very much, Christina. Thank you very much, Michael. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, yeah. We're looking forward to new ideas. Yeah. You said yesterday, you know, based on the old in the present towards the future. It will be a bright future. Thank you very much. And we we'll see each other next week. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye.